from Moses Myomites, The Guide for the Perplexed. Part 1, chapters 31 through 34, on the study of metaphysics. Or more particularly, why the uninitiated should not attempt such a study. <clears throat> Chapter 31. Know that, for the human mind, there are certain objects of perception which are within the scope of its nature and capacity. On the other hand, there are, amongst things which actually exist, certain objects which the mind can in no way and by no means grasp. The gates of perception are closed against it. Further, there are things of which the mind understands one part but remains ignorant in the other. And when man is able to comprehend certain things, it does not follow he must be able to comprehend everything. This also applies to the senses. They are able to perceive things, but not at every distance. And all other powers of the body are limited in a similar way. A man can, for example, carry two kitara, but he cannot carry ten. How individuals of the same species surpass one another in these sensations and in other bodily functions is universally known. But there is a limit to them, and their power cannot extend to every distance or to every degree. All this is applicable to the intellectual faculties as well. There is a considerable difference between one person and another as regards these faculties, as is well known to philosophers. While one man can discover a certain thing by himself, another is never able to understand it, even if he is taught by all means of all possible expressions and metaphors, and during a long period, his mind can no way grasp it. His capacity is insufficient. This distinction is not limited. A boundary is undoubtedly set to the human mind, which it cannot pass. There are things beyond that boundary which are acknowledged to be inaccessible to human understanding, and man does not show any desire to comprehend them, being aware that such knowledge is impossible, and that there are no means of overcoming the difficulty. For example, we do not know the exact number of stars in heaven, whether they are odd or even we do not even know the exact number of animals, minerals, or plant species, and the like. There are other things, however, which we very much desire to know, and strenuous efforts to examine and to investigate them have been made by thinkers of all classes and at all times. They differ and they disagree, and they constantly raise new doubts with regard to them, because their minds are bent on comprehending such things, that is to say, they are moved by their desire. And every one of them believes that he has discovered the way leading to a true knowledge of the thing. Although human reason is entirely able, unable to demonstrate the fact by convincing evidence. For a proposition which can be proved by evidence is not subject to dispute, denial, or rejection. None but the ignorant would contradict it. And such contradiction is called denial of dem demonstrated proof. Thus, you find men who deny the spherical form of the earth, or the circular form of the line in which the stars move, and the like. Such men as that are not considered in this treatise. This confusion prevails mostly in metaphysical subjects, and less so in problems relating to actual physics, and is entirely absent from the exact sciences. Alexander Aphrodisius said that there are three causes which prevent men from discovering the exact truth. First, arrogance and vainglory. Secondly, the subtlety, depth, and difficulty of any subject which is being examined. And thirdly, ignorance and want of capacity to comprehend what might be comprehended. These causes are not enumerated, or they are enumerated by Alexander. At the present time, I believe there's a fourth cause not mentioned by him, because it did not then prevail, namely, the habit and training. We naturally like what we have been accustomed to, and we're attracted towards it. This may be observed amongst villagers, though they rarely enjoy the benefit of a douche or a bath, and they have few enjoyments, and they pass a life of privation, they dislike town life, and do not desire its pleasures, preferring the inferior things to which they are accustomed, to the better things to which they are strangers. It would give them no satisfaction to live in palaces, to be clothed in silk, and to indulge in baths, ointments, and perfumes. The same is the case with those opinions of man 
to which he has been accustomed from his youth. He likes them, he defends them, and he shuns opposing views. This is likewise one of the causes which prevent men from finding truth, and which make them cling to their habitual opinions. Such is, for example, the case with vulgar notions with respect to the corporeality of God, and many other metaphysical questions, as we shall explain. It is the result of a long familiarity with passages of the Bible, which they are accustomed to respect and to receive as true, and the literal sense of which implies the corporeality of God, and other false notions. In truth, however, because these words were employed as figures and metaphors for reasons to be mentioned below. Do not imagine that what we have said of the insufficiency of our understanding and of its limited extent is an assertion founded only on the Bible. For philosophers likewise assert the matter, and perfectly understand it without having any regard to religion or opinion. It is a fact which is only doubted by those who ignore things fully proved. This chapter is, introduced as, is inter, intended as an introduction to the next. Chapter 32 You must consider, when reading this treatise, that mental perception, because it is connected with matter, is subject to conditions similar to those which physical perception is subject. That is to say, if your eye looks around, you can perceive all that is within your range, the range of your vision. If, however, you overstrain your eye, exerting it too much by attempting to see an object which is too distant for your eye, or to examine writings or engravings that are too small for your sight, and forcing it to obtain a correct perception of them, you will not only weaken your sight with regard to that special object, but also for those things which you otherwise are able to perceive. Your eye will have become too weak to perceive what you were able to see before you exerted yourself and exceeded the limits of your vision. The same is the case with the speculative faculties of one who devotes himself to the study of any science. If a person studies too much and exhausts his reflective powers, he will be confused. He will not be able to apprehend even that which had been within the power of his apprehension. For the powers of the body are all alike in this respect. The mental perceptions are not exempt from a similar condition. If you admit the doubt and do not persuade yourself to believe that there is a proof for things which cannot be de demonstrated, or to try at once to reject and positively to deny an assertion the opposite of which has never been proved, or to attempt to perceive things which are beyond your perception, then you have attained the highest degree of human perfection. You are like Rabbi Akiva, who in peace entered the study of these theological problems and came out in peace. If, on the other hand, you attempt to exceed the limit of your intellectual power, or at once to reject things as impossible, which have never been proved to be impossible, and which are in fact quite possible, though their possibility may be very remote, then you will be like Elisha Acher. You will not only fail to become perfect, but you will become exceedingly imperfect. Ideas founded on mere imagination will prevail over you. You will incline you will incline towards defects and toward base and degraded habits, on account of the confusion which troubles the mind, and of the dimness of, of its light, just as the weakness of sight causes invalids to see many kinds of unreal images, especially when they have longed for looked for a long time at dazzling or very minute objects. Respecting this, it has been said Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Proverbs 25, verse 16. Our sages also applied this verse to Elisha Aher. How excellent is this simile! In comparing knowledge to food, the author of Proverbs mentions the sweetest food, namely honey which has the further property of irritating the stomach and of causing sickness. He thus fully describes the nature of knowledge, though great, excellent, noble, and perfect, it is injurious if not kept within bounds or not guarded properly. It is like honey which gives nourishment and is pleasant when, meat, when eaten in moderation, but is totally thrown away when eaten immoderately. Therefore, it is not said, lest thou be filled and loathe it, but lest thou 
vomited. The same idea is expressed in the words, Is it not good to eat much honey? From Proverbs 25, verse 27. And in the words, Neither make thyself overwise, why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 16. Compare this with, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. The same subject is alluded to in the words of David. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Psalms 331, verse 2. And in the sayings of our sages, Do not inquire into things which are too difficult for thee. Do not search what is hidden from thee. Study what you are allowed to, and do not occupy thyself with mysteries. They meant to say, let thy mind only attempt things which are within human perception, for the study of things which lie beyond man's comprehension is extremely injurious, as has already been stated. This lesson is also contained in the Talmudical passage, which begins, He who considers four things, and concludes, He who does not regard the honor of his Creator. Here also is given the advice which we have already mentioned, namely that man should not rashly engage in speculation with false conceptions. And when he is in doubt about anything or unable to find a proof for the object of his inquiry, he must not at once abandon, reject, and deny it. He must modestly keep back and from regard to the honor of his creator hesitate and pause. This has already been explained. It was not the object of the prophets and our sages in these utterances to close the gate of investigation entirely, and to prevent the mind from comprehending what is within its reach, as is imagined by simple and idle people, whom it suits better to put forth their ignorance and incapacity as wisdom and perfection, and to regard the distinction and wisdom of others as irreligion and imperfection, thus taking darkness for light and light for darkness. The whole object of the prophets and the sages was to declare that a limit is set to human reason where it must halt. Do not criticize the words used in this chapter, and in others in reference to the mind, for we only intended to give some idea of the subject in view, not to describe the essence of the intellect, for other chapters have been dedicated to this subject. Chapter 33 you must know that it is very injurious to begin with this branch of philosophy, metaphysics, or to explain, at first, the sense of the similes occurring in prophecies, and interpret the metaphors which are employed in historical accounts and which abound in the writings of the prophets. On the contrary, it is necessary to initiate the young and to instruct the less intelligent according to their comprehension. Those who appear to be talented and to have capacity for the higher method of study, those based on proof and on true logical argument, should be gradually advanced towards perfection, either by tuition or by self-instruction. He, however, who begins with metaphysics will not only become confused in matters of religion, but will fall into complete infidelity. I compare such a person to an infant fed with wheat and bread, meat and wine. It will undoubtedly die, not because such food is naturally unfit for the human body, but because of the weakness of the child who is unable to digest the food and cannot derive benefit from it. The same is the case with the true principles of science. These were presented in enigmas, clad in riddles, and taught by all wise men in the most mysterious way that they could, be, that they could devise, not because they contain some secret evil or are contrary to the fundamental principles of the law, as fools think who are only philosophers in their own eyes, but because of the incapacity of man to comprehend them at the beginning of his studies. Only slight allusions are made to them to serve for the guidance of those who are capable of further understanding. These sciences were, therefore, called mysteries, or sodot, and secrets of the law. Sitre Torah, as we shall explain. This is also the reason why the Torah speaks the language of man, as we have explained, for it is the object of the Torah to serve as a guide for the instruction of the young 
of women and of common people. And as all of them are incapable to comprehend the true sense of the words, don't cancel him. He was writing in the 12th century in the golden age of Islam. He actually wrote in Arabic, um, and this was retranslated back into Hebrew, and then into Greek, and then into Latin, and so forth. So it is a bit dated. But I digress. Tradition was considered sufficient to convey all truths which were to be established. And as regards ideals, only such remark were made as would lead towards a knowledge of their existence, though not to a comprehension of their true essence. When a man attains to perfection and arrives at a knowledge of the secrets of the law, either through the assistance of a teacher or by self-instruction, being led by the understanding of one part to the study of the other, he will belong to those who faithfully believe in the true principles, either because of conclusive proof where it is possible, or by forcible argument where argument is admissible. But he will have a true notion of those things which he previously received in similes and metaphors, and he will fully understand their sense. We have frequently mentioned this treatise as the principle of our sages, not to discuss the ma'asse merkabba even in the presence of one pupil, except he that be wise and intelligent, and then only the headings of the chapters are to be given to him. We must, therefore, begin with teaching these subjects according to the capacity of the pupil, and on two conditions. First, that he be wise, that he should have successfully gone through the preliminary studies, and secondly, that he be intelligent, talented, clear-headed, and of quick perception, that is, to have a mind of his own, mebien midaato, as our sages termed it. I will now proceed to explain the reasons why we should not instruct the multitude in pure metaphysics, or begin with describing to them the true essence of things, or with showing them that a thing must be as it is and cannot be otherwise. This will form the subject of the next chapter, and I proceed to say, chapter 34, there are five reasons why instruction should not begin with metaphysics, but should be f at first restricted to pointing out what is fitted for notice and what may be made manifest to the multitudes. The first reason. The subject itself is difficult, subtle, and profound. Far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7, verse 24. The following words of Job may also be applied to it, from Job chapter uh, 28, verse 20. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Instruction should not begin with abstruse and difficult subjects. In one of the similes contained in the Bible, wisdom is compared to water, and among other interpretations given by our sages of this simile occurs the following. He who can swim may bring up pearls from the depth of the sea. He who is unable to swim will surely be drowned. Therefore, only such persons as have had proper instruction should expose themselves to the risk. The second reason. The intelligence of man is at first insufficient, for he is not endowed with perfection at the beginning, but it first possesses perfection only in potentia not in fact. Thus it is said, and man is born a wild ass, from Job chapter 11, verse 12. If a man possess a certain faculty in potentia, it does not follow that it must become in him a reality. He may possibly remain deficient either on account of some obstacle or from want of training and practices which would turn the possibility into a reality. Thus, it is distinctly stated, not many are wise. Also, our sages say, I noticed how few were those who attained to a higher degree of perfection. There are many things which obstruct the path to perfection, which keep man away from it. Where can he find sufficient preparation and leisure to learn all that is necessary in order to develop that perfection which he has had in potentia? The third reason why you should not begin studying metaphysics. 
The preparatory studies are of a long duration, and man, in his natural desire to reach the goal, finds them frequently too wearisome, and does not wish to be troubled by them. Be convinced that if man were able to reach the end without preparatory studies, such studies would not be preparatory, but would be tiresome and utterly superfluous. Suppose you awaken any person, even in the most, even the most simple, as if from some sleep, and you say to him, do you not desire to know what the heavens are? What is their number and their form? What beings are contained in them? What the angels are? How the creation of the whole world took place? What exactly is its purpose? What is the relation of its various parts to each other? What is the nature of the soul? How does it enter the body, whether it has an independent existence? And if so, how can it exist independently of the body? By what means and to what purpose? in similar problems, he would undoubtedly say, yes, and show a natural desire for the true knowledge of all these things. But he will wish to satisfy that desire and to attain that knowledge by listening to but a few words from you. Ask him to interrupt his usual pursuits for a week until he learn all of this, and he would not do it. He would be satisfied and contend with imaginary and misleading notions. He would refuse to believe that there is anything which requires preparatory study and persevering research. You, however, know that all of these subjects are connected together, for there is nothing else in the existence but God and his works, and the latter including all existing things besides him. We can only obtain a knowledge of him through his words, works. His works give evidence of his creation and show what must be assumed concerning him, that is to say, what must be attributed to him, either affirmatively or negatively. It is thus necessary to examine all things according to their essence, to infer from every species such true and well-established propositions as may assist us in the solution of metaphysical problems. Again, Many propositions based on the nature of numbers and the properties of geometrical figures are most useful in examining things which must be negatived in reference to God, and these negations will lead us to further inferences. You will certainly not doubt the necessity of studying astronomy and physics if you are desirous of comprehending the relation between the world and the divine providence as it is in reality and not according to mere imagination. There are also many subjects of speculation, which, though not preparing the way for metaphysics, do help to train the reasoning power, enabling it to understand the nature of a proof and to treat truth by characteristics essential to it. They remove the confusion arising in the minds of most thinkers who confound accidental with essential properties, and likewise the wrong opinions resulting therefrom. We may add that although they do not form the basis for metaphysical research, they assist in forming a correct notion of these things, and they are certainly useful in many other things connected with that discipline. Consequently, he who wishes to attain to human perfection must therefore first study logic, next the various branches of mathematics and in their proper order then to physics, and lastly, metaphysics. We find that many who have advanced to a certain point in the study of these disciplines become weary and stop, and that others who are endowed with sufficient capacity are then interrupted in their studies by death, which surprises them while still engaged with the preliminary course. Now, if no knowledge whatever had been given to us by means of tradition, and if we had not been brought to the belief in a thing through the medium of similes, we would have been bound to form a perfect notion of things with their essential characteristics, and to believe only what we could prove, a goal which could only be attained by long preparation. In such a case, most people would die without having known whether there was a god or not, much less that certain things must be asserted about him, and other things denied as defects. From such a fate, not even one of a city or two of a family would have escaped. As regards the privileged few, the remnant whom the Lord calls, 
they, they only attain the perfection at which they aim after due preparatory labor. The necessity of such a preparation and the need of such a training for the acquisition of real knowledge has been plainly stated by King Solomon in the following words. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. And it is profitable to prepare for wisdom. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiast, uh, chapter 10, verse 10. Hear, counsel, and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. From Proverbs 29, verse 20. That would be, excuse me, 19, verse 20. There is still another urgent reason why the preliminary disciplines should be studied and understood. During the study, many doubts present themselves, and the difficulties, or the objections raised against certain assertions, are soon understood just as the demolition of a building is far easier than its construction. While on the other hand, it is impossible to prove an assertion or to remove any doubts without having recourse to several propositions taken from these preliminary studies. He who approaches metaphysical problems without proper preparation is like a person who journeys towards a certain place and on the road falls into a deep pit, out of which he cannot rise and he must perish there. If he had not gone forth, but had remained at home, it would have been better for him. Solomon has expatiated in the book of Proverbs on sluggards and their indolence, by which he figuratively refers to indolence in the search after wisdom. He thus speaks of a man who desires to know the final results, but does not exert himself to understand the preliminary disciplines which lead to them, doing nothing else but desire. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Proverbs 21, verses 25 and 26. That is to say, if the desire killeth the slothful, it is because he neglects to seek the thing which might satisfy his desire. He does nothing but desire, and hopes to obtain a thing without using the means to reach it. It would be better for him were he without that desire. Observe how the end of the simile throws light on its beginning. It concludes with the words, But the righteous giveth and spareth not. The antithesis of righteous and slothful can only be justified on the basis of our interpretation. Solomon thus indicates that only such a man is righteous who gives to everything its due portion that is to say, who gives to the study of a thing the whole time required for it, and does not devote any part of that time to another purpose. The passage may therefore be paraphrased thus, and the righteous man devotes his ways to wisdom, and does not withhold any of them. The majority of scholars, that is to say the most famous in science, are afflicted with this failing, namely that of hurrying at once to the final results, and of speaking about them without treating the preliminary disciplines. Led by folly or ambition to disregard those preparatory studies for the attainment of which they are either incapable or too idle, some scholars endeavor to prove that these are injurious or superfluous. Our reflection, on reflection, the truth will become obvious. The fourth reason and remember, there are five. The fourth reason is taken from the physical constitution of man. It has been proved that moral conduct is a preparation for intellectual progress, and that only a man whose character is pure, calm, and steadfast can attain to the intellectual perfection, that is, to acquire correct conceptions. Many men are naturally so constituted that all perfection is impossible, for example, he whose heart is very warm and is himself very powerful is sure to be passionate, though he tries to counteract that disposition by training. He whose testicles are warm, humid, and vigorous, and the organ connected therewith is surcharged, he will not easily refrain from sin, even if he makes great efforts to restrain himself. 
You also find persons of great levity and rashness, whose excited manners and wild gestures prove that their constitution is in disorder, and that their temperament is so bad that it cannot be cured. Such persons can never attain to perfection. It is utterly useless to occupy oneself with them on such a subject as metaphysics. For this science is, as you know, different from the sciences of medicine and of geometry, and for the reasons already mentioned, it is not every person who is capable of approaching it. It is impossible for a man to study it successfully without moral preparation. He must acquire the highest degree of uprightness and integrity. For the froward is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Proverbs 3, verse 32. Therefore, it was considered inadvisable to teach it to young men. Nay, it is impossible for them to comprehend it on account of the heat of their blood and the flame of their youth, which confuses their minds. That heat, which causes all the disorder, must first disappear. They must have become moderate and settled, humble in their hearts, and subdued in their temperament. Only then will they be able to arrive at the highest degree of the perception of God, that is, the study of metaphysics, which is called Ma'asa Merkaba. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. I dwell in the high and lofty place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Therefore the rule, the headings of the sections may be confided to him, is further restricted in the Talmud in the following way. The headings of the sections must only be handed down to an abedin, the president of the court, whose heart is full of care, that is, in whom wisdom is united with humility, meekness, and a great dread of sin. It is further stated that the secrets of the law can only be communicated to a counselor, a scholar, and a good orator. These qualities can only be acquired if the physical constitution of the student favor their development. You certainly know that some persons, though exceedingly able, are very weak in giving counsel, while others are ready with proper counsel and good advice in both social and political matters. A person so endowed is called a counselor, and may be unable to comprehend purely abstract motions, even such as are similar to common sense. He is unacquainted with them, and has no talent whatever for them. We apply to him the words, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to see it? Proverbs 27, verse 16. Others are intelligent and naturally clear-sighted, able to convey complicated ideas in concise and well-chosen language. Such a person is called a good orator, but he has not been engaged in the pursuit of science, or has not acquired any knowledge of it. Those who have actually acquired a knowledge of the sciences are called wise in arts, or scholars. The Hebrew term for wise in arts, being chakam harashim, has been explained in the Talmud as implying when such a man speaks, all become, as it were, speechless. Now consider how, in the writings of the rabbis, the admission of a person into discourses on metaphysics is made dependent on distinction in social qualities and study of philosophy, as well as on the possession of clear-sightedness, intelligence, eloquence, and the ability to communicate things by slight illusion. If a person satisfies these requirements, then the secrets of the law are confided to him. In the same place, we also read the following passage. Rabbi Chakanin said to Rabbi Elisar, Come, I will teach you the Masa'ag Merkaba. And his reply was, I am not yet old. Or in other words, I have not yet become old. I still perceive in myself the hot blood and the rashness of youth. You learn from this that, in addition to the above-named good qualities, a certain age is also required. How, then, could any person speak on these metaphysical themes in the presence of ordinary people, or of children, or of women. Again, 12th century. The fifth reason. 
Man is disturbed in his intellectual occupation by the necessity of looking after the material wants of his body, especially the necessity of providing for wife and children, if it be superadded. Much more so if he seeks superfluities in addition to his ordinary wants, for by custom and bad habits these become a powerful motive. Even the perfect man to whom we have referred, if too busy with these necessary things, much more so if busy with unnecessary things, and filled with a great desire for them, must weaken or altogether lose his study for desire, to which he will apply himself with interruption, lassitude, and want of attention. He will not attain to that which he is fitted for by his abilities, or he will acquire imperfect knowledge, a confused mass of true and false ideas. For these reasons it was proper that the study of metaphysics should have been exclusively cultivated by privileged persons, and not entrusted to the common people. It is not for the beginner, and he should abstain from it, as the little child has to abstain from taking solid food and from carrying heavy weights.